So please. Am I audible? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello, am I audible? Yeah, yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. It's audible, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I can't uh, hear your voice. Uh, so let me start uh, the second session. And uh, if at any point of time uh, you feel that uh, I'm not audible, just let me know because uh, I don't know why your voice voices are uh, not audible. So uh, in this uh, session, we will be, the agenda of this uh, session will be like uh, briefly, we will be covering about the sustainability uh, as we all know that uh, this particular topic is quite common. We have been uh, going through this topic in our first MDP and uh, and almost all the time we have been talking about this concept of sustainability or sustainable development. Then we will jump on sustainability reporting, its history, uh, reporting landscape, difference between the annual reporting and sustainability reports, GRI initiative. Uh, those SASB, as uh, we have seen in our uh, previous discussion, that uh, SASB, uh, like we are a value reporting uh, foundation, is a new emergence. So we'll try to go through that also. And we'll try to compare all the possible frameworks which are there. Now, if you look into this definition, it is very obvious quite available on internet when we talk about or when we are writing this paper of sustainability, uh, we need to quote this definition of uh, sustainability where it is talking about that development that meet the need of the present and without compromising the ability of future generations, future generations to meet their own need. It has been uh, Uh, I'll just take care of uh, the participants. They are like waiting in a lobby. So kindly approve them so that So, uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, this definition, as we have been talking about, it is the most common definition which has been given by the Brooklyn Report, uh, Brooklyn Commission, uh, in a book uh, named Our Common Future. And most importantly, to note that uh, this uh, report actually has been formed by the former Norway Prime Minister, Harald Brutling, 
and uh, in the committee uh, we will feel pride to know that uh, one of the indian was there in this uh, committee that was uh, mr nagendra singh he was a member of this committee of uh, brooklyn commission uh, who was a part of this uh, uh, committee who has given this concept of sustainable development now in 1987 this concept had been given and formalized about the sustainable development but the most important part uh, for all of us to know is that is it sustainability has been started from 1987 so if you see this concept swachh bharat abhiyan which has been initiated by the government of india in uh, 2014 with lot many initiatives uh, in this particular event uh, he has focused on cleaning of our country but if you see that uh, if you look into this picture which is here uh, we all know that there is an open defecation where uh, uh, if you talk about our country we are one of the leading country in open defecation and we have a, a, a very bad reputation in terms of uh, the cleanliness etc but let me remind you that sulab international uh, ngo which is uh, having the longest chain in the world for uh, uh, the sulab complex has in his manual it has mentioned that the uh, the concept of uh, sanitation is very old in our uh, country from harappa civilization it is there means almost uh, in the year of 2500 bc this concept was there and in harappa civilization we were having a very concrete con uh, con uh, consolidated culture where we were having a closed uh, system of sanitation in our uh, uh, country so from 2500 bc to uh, 2020 you can say in last 3000 years what has actually changed where from uh, the closed system a very hygienic system to we came up to this level uh, it's a very long history to say but actually in between a uh, lot many invaders uh, uh, tribes they came here and slowly and slightly this culture has vanished and we go went for a convenience so but over a period of time from 2014 onward our prime minister our government of india has put forward a very strong emphasis on ch uh, challenging this issue and uh, let me tell you that in due course of time it has been revised a lot Uh, from somewhere around the uh, uh, 24% uh, at this point of time in 2020 the defecation has been reduced to 14% uh, a remarkable change has been found out in this due course of time so we can say that yes in uh, if there is a possible uh, if there is a will there is a way and we uh, worked on that then there is another reality which we have to understand and if we look at ourselves we can find out that it is very close to us the problem of obesity uh, if we look around or if we uh, if we look ourselves we can find out that this this problem is quite increasing and our, uh, it is very alarming to say because at this point of time we have a very important point to note that at this point of time we are very very much suffering and uh, like if i i would say that according to the data if i I tell you that uh, globally 2016 around 9 39% people were overweight and 13% were obese according to the who data i am talking about and in india if i talk about it is 3.9% people were obese now there is a difference between overweight and obese uh, overweight people are those who have their bmi above 25 and obese are those who have a bmi above 30 and Uh, in india we were having the percentage of around 3.9% which is somewhere equivalent to 4% which is 5% of the total obese population in the world and according to the estimates if i tell you in 2030 this will be 5% uh, uh, sorry this will be like uh, 5% and up in due course of time it will reach up to 11% of the total world population in india so you can imagine that this is a slowly and slightly killing disease which is emerging and the next one is environmental pollution we know if you go to all the big cities uh, be it is delhi mumbai uh, kolkata lucknow 
all these cities have uh, this problem and uh, we have a very high pollution levels pm 2.5 if we talk about it is very high in all these cities if if we go by the global data we can find out that uh, uh, in top 20 cities in the world we'll find out majority of uh, the cities belong to our country india now the question comes that who is actually responsible for this now if i ask this question to the public it may be like uh, who is actually responsible as we have been discussing in the last session that maybe uh, every organization every uh, person is actually contributing to toward the sustainability but actually who is responsible for all these uh, be it is obesity be it is environmental pollution be it is a uh, deforestation or any possible uh, climate change which are happening around us who is actually responsible either the companies which are working for us be it is a pharmaceutical company, uh, be it is a FMCG company or the automobile companies which are working for us or any kind of company per se we can talk about. But are they only responsible for all these activities? So the answer is no. The thing which is actually highly responsible for all these things is our convenience. At this point of time, uh, especially in the last two years of time, we might have seen that uh, due to the COVID, uh, the supply of these uh, online retailers uh, came into the picture and the supply chain had become so convenient. So convenience is one particular factor which is actually responsible for all possible activities. We, we love to eat good food. We love to eat uh, junk food. We want to go to the McDonald's, KFC, Pizza Hut, etc. So, in increase of the income leads to our convenience and that is what highly responsible now if you talk about why is it so why it is happening so there are few reasons it could be a number of reasons but here i'm pointing out a few of the reasons like we have a tendency we are moving more towards the western culture and we wish to shop till you drop like we want to fill our trolley till then if you are going to the big bazaar if there is an offers going on like uh, uh, success then etc then we wish to fill up our whole uh, trolley so that we can get grab some of the offers which are available which are floating by the uh, retail stores then throw away lifestyle if we have our parties uh, birthday party particularly if i take an example of the birthday party we know that in indian culture we have uh, uh, during our uh, birthday celebrations, according to the Indian value system, we used to provide cheer uh, to our uh, uh, the person who is having a birthday. But because of the change in our lifestyle, we wish to have a big cake. If the cake is not available, which means that there is a no birthday party. So that is the one important reason. Perceived absolutions. If you look around and check out our mobile phones. Though we know that our mobile phone may work for another two years or three years of duration, but we wish that if new mobile phone is coming into the market, then we will uh, go and grab that. So no matters, uh, our present mobile may work for another uh, uh, two to three years. PPTs are visible. Uh, Yes, is that the PPTs are visible or not? Yes, sir. PPT is visible. Uh, yes, give me one second. Let me. Uh, I, I'm facing some problem. I don't know why. So give me a second. Uh, let me uh, come back okay. to you. February. Okay. February. So me. March. Hmm? March. March. Kitty, uh, February. Okay, guys. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Hello. It's audible, sir. 
गुड मॉर्निंग मला जरा सांगा गीतांजली गाडगे आणि श्रद्धा पाटील काय त्यांचा फीचर स्टेटस आहे actually i am not uh, able to hear your voices so the problem is here are we audible sir am i audible sir sir am i audible yes sir you are audible right right thank you sir. anybody's hear my, my voice am i audible because i am not able to hear your voices yes sir mahendra yes, sir, sir. you are audible, audible sir yes sir you are audible sir you are audible sir i'm sorry uh, actually at this point of time i can't hear your voices so i'm not able to recognize that am i audible or not uh, good to see that i you can hear me but uh, it's a kind of a forum where uh, where open voices are there then it will be much more beneficial but at this point of time i really don't know what is happening with our ms team uh, Actually, I changed my speaker options, uh, but still, I don't know why it is not working. I'll try to fix it. Fix it up because. Uh... So, uh, like as we have been talking about perceived absolutions, is one of the area where uh, due to which this kind of problems are actually arising. And rush for the latent demands. We do not need. Uh, we do understand that we do have our specific needs. If we are fulfilling. then uh, we can do our job but apart from that we are pushing forward for our latent demands we might have heard of these uh, latent demands in our economics uh, books and chapters this is something which push us to gain and buy more though we have all possible things all amenities available with us and due to that we will find out at the after a period of time we have ample of things electronic gadgets if you talk about and other accessories are surplus our surplus in number at our home and thereafter we will be faced problem so at this point of time there's a concept of millimanism is coming up where we are talking about that you need to have the things with minimum at your house so that you can live happily and instead of that you should have a full of your uh, like almira with a full of the clothes etc that should not be there and if we can have these things then only we can actually talk about so if you see convenience at every point of time we are talking about convenience and convenience lead to the cost and cost lead to the catastrophic if you look at present scenario across if you talk about all the possible indicators you'll find out they are dragging us to the downside be it is uh, water levels be it is environmental pollution be it is temperature or any other thing they are on a very downside very high side if i talk about and in due for in a in a in a century maybe we will not be able to face this uh, increase in temperature or a rise in the water level but maybe our generations will definitely face the repercussions of our actions what we need to do we need to make a balance between the sustainability and economics and here it is very much important at this point of time to look into that as uh, our co coordinator has talked about that we want everything but don't want to care about somebody else will do and you will enjoy that that need to leave we need to let, leave that particular action so that we can at least survive our future generations can survive for a longer period of time what are the possible solutions we have we need to play within the rules in our pursuit of the material progress and enjoyment now here the most important point i just wanted to quote is that all these things have already been mentioned in our 
Vedas, the scriptures, and in Indian value system, they all were there. It is uh, all the possible solutions I have extracted from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in chapter 3, uh, Sloka 10, it has been mentioned that we need to play within the rules of our pursuit of material progress and enjoyment. What actually we need, we have to buy only that much. Principle of mutual dependence. It is most important part. We practice, we, we have practiced in our childhood days and have been told and have been told uh, uh, throughout our journey of life, but slowly and slightly you are moving away. No matter if we see some accident happening in our uh, while passing by, we ignore that because we need to rush to our office at a uh, at the right time, and we ignore that. So it is something which is very much important. If you are, if somebody, if your neighbor is in a need, we need to help him out. And particularly at this point of time in a COVID, uh, it has been observed that majority of the families, if somebody might have been suffering due to the COVID, people ignore them. The society totally ignore them, their family members, even they do not allow the vendors to go to that home. So don't you think that this mutual dependence is slowly and slightly moving away from our life, our value system, which is one of the priority, which was one of the priority in our Indian value system. We are more selfish in nature. We are going to be more selfish in nature. Then the third one is yagya, where when we are talking about yagya is nothing but sharing. We need to donate, we need to uh, share what we have with others. Be it is Bhut, Manushya, Dev, Pitra, Brahma, for the God, for our family members, uh, to our ancestors. We need to share all these things so that we can have a mutual dependence we can actually work for each other. And then, most important part which we are going to address in our due course of time, in our five days of MVP, that is matrix for sustainability. Today, we are talking about a lot many indices, a lot many members, but this matrix of sustainability have been existed in our uh, uh, Vedas long back. And it has been mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita also. That for example, if I tell you, that rain, rain is a symbol of matters of sustainability. If there is a good rain, there will be uh, we will be having a good food grains and so on and so forth. So the concept of matrix was was already there, but we at this point of time. But at this point of time, we are. Coming up with a new uh, set of uh, uh, matrices. Now, if you look into this particular slide, you can find out, you can correlate very easily that these two are our uh, class 10th and 12th mark sheets. Now, the question comes that why it is here and what is the purpose of placing mark sheet at this point of time? Now, the thing is that these mark sheets actually replicate our performance. What we have learned throughout maybe in the class 10th or 12th or, 10th, or in any standard if we talk about these mark sheets help us to understand that what actually we have learned and what is our present status so with the help of these report cards and mark sheets we'll try to uh, improve ourselves in a specific area I suppose if i'm not good into the mathematics at least with the help of these uh, evaluating parameters I can improve myself and in due course of time, I can do better in the mathematics. So this, these are nothing but a report map which help us to understand that what is our present status, for example, in academics. Similarly, for business sections, we do have these kind of the uh, uh, graphs available, which looks quite disturbing. And But if you look into the all these graphs, you may find out that they all are talking about either the economics, sustainability, talking about the environmental sustainability, or focusing on the social perspective, how we are actually working on. So here, in order to understand that, we came to the sustainability reporting topic and focus on, in due course of time, in our five-day MVP, we will be focusing on the sustainability reporting, the different aspects and perspective. But before that, let's have a, a thought process on the evolution of sustainability reporting. The concept of sustainability reporting has started on our first Earth Day on 22nd April 1970. 
Thereafter, from 1970 to 1980s, there are a lot many environmental catastrophes happened. For example, in the year of uh, 1965, around uh, one very uh, stringent catastrophe happened in America, Ohio, where uh, it was named as a fire river. Due to the spill of water, uh, oil, this uh, river was having a fire throughout the year for so many years. Thereafter, in 1984, if you guys remember, there was a, a Bhopal gas tragedy plant, which was uh, a very disastrous, where a lot many people have lost their life, and are somewhere around uh, in thousands, in lakhs, you can say, people suffered. And today, even today, people are suffering. And after that, when, when these many uh, environmental catastrophes have actually happened, then the chemical industry came up with the concept of responsible care. Where they told that, look boss, we are also taking, we are responsible and we are working for the environment. So they came up with a consortium of responsible care where all the chemical, uh, chemical companies they come together and uh, focus on the environmental sustainability. At the same time, uh, one year later, in 1986, EPCRA Act, USA came into the picture, that is uh, emergency planning and uh, community uh, know, know your assets act actually came into the picture where they have focused on what are the things that we need so that uh, uh, like companies who are doing wrong to the environment, they should uh, address that. And most important part or the interesting part in this EPCRA act was that somewhere around 300 extremely hazardous substance myths have been declared by the group. And uh, companies have been asked that you have to report these 300 substances, how these 300 substances are actually uh, uh, there in your uh, industry actions. And in the very next year, this companies have started publishing their report. And most importantly, uh, the thing which has happened is that billion of kgs of toxic release have been accepted by the companies in US. And thereafter, the environmentalists got shocked and came uh, realized that uh, these organizations, they are releasing a very huge amount of the toxic substances to the environment. And this, the more stringent after that point of time. Then in the year of 1987, Brooklyn Commission report came and the very first time the concept of sustainable development has been coined. In 19, in 19, uh, in 1997, the triple bottom line concept have been given by John, John L. Clinton. Uh, he's a pioneer in sustainability. And uh, in his book, he has talked about that apart from business, like apart from the profits, which is a, tr a true business uh, bottom line, we need to look into the three concepts together, economic, environmental, and social, at, at the same level. Thereafter, it has been faced that people uh, find out that actually it is not possible for businesses to equivalent all these three different parameters at a simple, uh, on a single platform. It has been revoked in 2012 and he has given a new definition for uh, this reporting. But in 1997, the GRI has been started off. In uh, sorry, in 1997, the GRI initiative has been started off. In 1999, United Nations Environmental Program has joined GRI, and first GRI guidelines have been proposed in 2000. And we might be knowing that in uh, two, 2000 year of 2000, this Millennium Development Goal (MDGs) have been defined by United Nations. And eight principles have been categorized. In, in these eight principles, primarily the uh, low developed economies have been targeted, especially the Asian economies and African economies have been targeted, where they focus on the social dimensions of the society in uh, considering the eight different principles. Then at the same time, in the same year, the UN uh, Global Compact has taken the picture. Uh, and after that, we find out that the reporting after that, we find out that 70% of the top uh, 250 companies started practicing sustainability reporting. In 2007, 
climate disclosure team, a standard board came to the picture, and so on and so forth. The evolution keep on going. And in 2012, Adam has defined sustainability report in a in a more comprehensive manner, in a more conducive manner to the businesses. And he told that it should provide a balance. including the positive and negative contributions. Uh, in our GRI uh, disclosures also will try to see that the same kind of thing have been initiated by the GRI also. In 2003-13, India uh, took this consideration and started with the ESG compliances, especially by the CAB. In uh, 2015, around, they have mandated the listed companies, 100 listed companies to uh, uh, talk about that uh, business responsibility report, that is BRR, which has been changed in 2021 uh, with a new name, that is uh, business responsibility and sustainability report. So in due course of time, a lot many development have been happened. And a uh, uh, lot many development have been happened and find out that uh, the sustainability is keep on, sustainability reporting keep on evolving. Now in order to understand this concept of sustainability reporting, we need to understand this reporting landscape, sustainability reporting landscape. And this landscape is broadly divided into the four areas which talks about the global goals and principles. If you see that we have uh, specific goals which have been primarily defined by the United Nations, likewise the sustainable development goals which have been uh, coined in the year of 2015, where 17 SDGs have been defined. And uh, have been asked that all the countries need to address these 17 SDGs. They are very much important to address. Then we have uh, principles for responsible investment, particularly for the investors and creditors, uh, have been initiated by the United Nations. Then we have a United Nations Global Compact, GRI, uh, sorry, Greenhouse Gas Protocol. These principles have been introduced. And along with that, we have a reporting framework, as we have been discussing in our First session also, lot many GRI, uh, sorry, lot many uh, the sustainability reporting frameworks are available at this point of time in the uh, in in the business domain. B, if you talk about uh, GRI, that is Global Reporting Initiative, SASB, it is a uh, uh, US-based uh, reporting parameter. Then we have integrated reporting. Uh, it is uh, also known as International Integrated Reporting Community. Then we have ISO, we know that most of uh, the organizations are basically talking about this ISO. Then we have TCFD, a lot more. And most importantly at this point of time, if I would say, as Sir was talking about, that uh, SASP and Integrated Reporting have joined together last year. And they have came up with a, a value reporting framework uh, as a new name. So these at this point of time, this concept of sustainability is keep on evolving and people are, businesses I would say, are more focused toward this as uh, Alka was talking about in the beginning that a lot many investments are actually coming into this through the ESG bonds, sustainable financing, etc. So the landscape of sustainability reporting is keep on increasing and as we know that there are a lot many reporting frameworks available. In order to substantiate that, we do have various ESG rating and indices available. Sustain, Sustain Analytics is one of the rating agencies which if you go on the website of Sustainable uh, Sustain Analytics, you'll find out they rate each and every company in terms of ESG parameters, how the company is performing. And it is very much valu valuable and beneficial for, uh, you can say, uh, mutual funds companies, insurance companies, because where they want to invest their corpus, that can be seen because the most important part is like as an individual or as an investor, if I'm investing in the company and the company is actually working for the ESG aspects, then we can assume that the, the prospect or the longevity of a company will be comparatively higher. So in order to address this, uh, uh, the various papers, these uh, eight agencies are there, then we have uh, Dow Jones index is available as Sir was talking about. Then we have MSCI, we have SEMA, and other agencies which are actually working on the uh, evaluation of the various reporting frameworks. Uh, in, in our later slide, we will discuss that why it is uh, like not many agencies are coming up to for the validation. 
basic reason is that we know that in accounting we have a standard set of pattern and that we need to follow but in reporting it is a evolving process so if you go by the gi there are uh, somewhere around uh, 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 three standard uh, universal standard disclosures are there that we will discuss and sasb have a different kind of format so even at this point of time maybe as an organization as i am talking about if i am working for uh, maybe i am following gri but what is the proof that whatever be the indicators i am mentioning in my report are substantial for all the possible investors for that we have a different rating agencies which are there who actually look after all these things what we are mentioning in our report then we have regulations like corporate sustainability reporting directives uh, tcfd uh, eu taxonomy regulations and sustainable financial disclosure regulations so these are some regulations which are there and the question has been asked in in the first session regarding uh, this uh, task force on climate related disclosures so it primarily work on three to four different parameters which is one is our governance how you are actually handling the climate change actions and the strategies in your organization so it talks about the governance structure it talks about the strategy to address the climate change then we have the matrix and how you are assessing the risk which is actually your business is doing to the environment so it is again an important aspect to check that risk assessment so these are the things these are the aspect which are there in tcfd to uh, address that and if you talk about the frameworks they all all these frameworks they follow all these regulations even if you talk about the sasb or gri they are working in very closely with each other to uh, make a common flat platform for the global world so that tomorrow when any company is actually addressing this thing they can have a common platform and actually everybody can follow the same principles likewise as we have in our accounting standards now <clears throat> we are talking about the sustainability report the basic thing is that we are already doing our uh, annual reporting we do have our annual uh, financial reports by end of the year financial year so why is it so required that we need to go for a sustainability report even if you look into our uh, sebi's uh, protocol or the sebi's statement it has been there that every organization those who are listed uh, it has been increased to somewhere around 1000 listed companies that they need to uh, address this uh, they need to fill up this uh, bs uh, brr report that is business responsibility report in their annual report which is a part of their annual report so why is it so that uh, the new concept of sustainability reporting is coming because we know that when this kind of concepts actually come there is a headache to the organization you need to appoint somebody for uh, doing all this kind of activities but the important part is uh, in annual reports they are primarily focusing on the investors creditors and uh, they can actually assess it or maybe for the finance guys but as a non finance guy like by me i'm not from the finance background but if i just wanted to check and understand the annual reports it will be a set of numbers which are there maybe the balance sheets profit and loss and so on and so forth so for me it is comparatively difficult to understand but Uh, if you look into the sustainability report it is a blend of qualitative and quantitative uh, disclosures which talks about that yes what we are doing in the different set of parameters and how we are doing what are the different uh, uh, positives and negatives we have that is actually addressed in that so in sustainability report we we address broad set of stakeholders be the government be the, uh, the people those who are making the policies a common investor if you talk about or a uh, uh, scholar who is not from the finance background or etc annual report follows the international financial uh, financial regulation standards uh, the accounting standards which are there whereas the sustainability reports follows the gri or sasb or iirc uh, frameworks uh, uh, guidelines then in annual report the most important part is that in annual report we do have our internal and external audit which is mandatory for all companies and uh, in internal and external audit we have a lot many cases you might have heard of the satyam case uh, satyam and maita case which has happened somewhere around uh, 2000 uh, 4 5 or 6 uh, 
due to the ex, uh, external audit uh, chaos. But that is mandatory. That is mandatory in annual report. But in case of sustainability report, the assurance is voluntary. Means if as a company, for example, GSW or uh, talk about any company, they are publishing their sustainability report. But who is going to assure that? So that is voluntary at this point of time because it is an evolving process. But in due course of time, we may find out because uh, SASB and IIRC has merged together. So slowly and slightly, they may come up with a universal standards uh, on GRI. And by that point of time, you may find out it will be quite similar to that of the annual reports where anybody can simply pick up the uh, sustainability report and assess the all possible information in a uniform manner. Be it is JSW, Tata Group of uh, Companies, or Reliance Group of Companies, and other company we talk about. So there will be a, a uniformity will be there in a sustainability report. But at this point of time, it is a quite evolving process. So we uh, uh, like, uh, experts are keep on improving in this area. Now, if you this is a report which has been published by KPMG. And if you look into this report, you may find out that uh, GRI is GRI is the most prominent work which has been reported by the long, numerous companies across the globe. So GRI is the most important reporting framework which has been used by majority of the companies, and it is a non-profit organization. You may go on the website download uh, the sustainability report of any of the organization at any point of time who are uh, publishing and uploading their uh, reports on the GRI portal. So this is uh, one platform which or one framework which provide us ample of information related to the sustainability reporting. Whereas SASB is primarily in US. Most of the US and Canadian companies are actually uh, publishing their report on, on the basis of SASB framework. Now let's look at the journey of most trusted sustainability reporting agency that is GRI. It has been started in 1997. Uh, they came up with a different uh, uh, standards, GRI 1, 2, 3, GRI 4, on which I worked on uh, somewhere around 2017. Uh, uh, we worked on GRI G4 sustainability reporting parameters. And now in 2020, they came up with an advanced version with a lot many modifications and changes. And at this point of time, they have included the sector specific standards also, along with the uh, global, uh, along with the universal standard and the specific standard disclosures. They came up with the sector standard disclosures also. The reason is SASB, if you see the SASB, they are publishing or providing framework in a 77 different sectors separately using the matrix and other phenomena. So in order to compete with the SASB and the IIRC, GRI is also moving ahead and starting publishing the uh, sector specific uh, uh, disclosures. Now, as, as we have been talking about the GRI and uh, uh, GRI is the most trusted uh, framework. So let's have a, a glimpse of GRI standard. Though in uh, different sessions, we might be going through the, uh, these uh, standards in a very uh, detailed manner. But here, let me give you a brief insight related to the GRI standards. It is broadly classified into the three areas. One is universal standards. It is having three standards with 33 disclosures. <coughs> that is GRI 101, GRI 102, and GRI 103. Then we have uh, sector standards. It is a one standard where we have uh, 22 material topics. It is primarily in, at this point of time, this one sector is oil and gas because uh, at this point of time, GRI is focusing on uh, uh, the industries which are more polluting uh, industries. So in due course of time, they are coming up, coming up with the various sector standards also. Then we have a specific standard disclosures uh, which includes 34 topic specific standards, which comprise of somewhere around 88 disclosures, which is uh, having like GRI 200, which is focusing on the involved, uh, economic sustainability. Then we have GRI 300, which talks about the environmental sustainability. And we have GRI 400, which uh, talks about the social 
sustainability. Now, the important aspect for uh, GRI is that when we are actually working on GRI, it is necessary to understand that how actually GRI work. So GRI work on the four basic concepts. One is our impact. How actually your uh, organization is actually impacting. So actually in this, we need to understand as an organization that we have how our impact is there on the economic environment and people including the effect on the human rights. This has a new disclosure which has been incorporated in uh, uh, in uh, GRI disclosures. It actually look into the impacts that can be actual or potential, maybe negative or positive, short term or long term, intended and unintended. For example, if I am working in a uh, oil company, maybe we all know that at this point of time, we do need oil because we do not have any other possible substitute at this point of time. Either EV we have an option, but that is not in our country. If I talk about, we are not sustainable enough, or we are not, we are not capable enough to provide EV facility across the country. Thus, we have to bank on oil and uh, oil, uh, particularly diesel or petrol. Thus, they do have a negative impact on economy and to the environment at the same time. We need, as a company, as an organization, we need to indicate that what are the negatives this company or oil company is actually having, uh, potential negatives and potential positives in a short term and long term. Then we have a material talk. This is something very much important, especially for those people who are working in this area, uh, especially the research scholar, uh, because material topic is, talk, is important to understand. Here, we need to identify what are the material topics are there in an organization, because in specific standards, we have a lot many standards are available, but which is more important? Likewise, we have 88 disclosures available with us, but for any organization, maybe one is working, uh, second is not working. Similarly, for any, any other organization, maybe the second is working, one is not working. So we need to find out the list of material topic in an organization, how they are actually uh, important for investors, for uh, company, for the state, all possible stakeholders. That is the responsibility of an organization. So we need to identify the list of material topics. Then we have due diligence. Now, due diligence is nothing but when we are finding out these material topics, we have to follow the due diligence process, which means that we need to consider all possible stakeholders which are who are there in this process. Maybe the supply chain partners, maybe the consumers, investors, every possible individual whosoever is directly or indirectly affecting with our actions need to be included in our in the selection of these material topics. We have stakeholders. Stakeholder means any kind of any individual or a group who is directly or indirectly being affected. So these are four basic key concepts of uh, GRI, which have been uh, disclosed in uh, uh, GRI 101. And then we have uh, eight reporting principles, which primarily focusing on that how we need to do the reporting part. Uh, this has also been mentioned in the GRI 101. So uh, it talks about the accuracy, like if I'm reporting one of the parameters, for example, emission or waste, so that should be accurate. It should not be like a false data we are putting in and uh, publishing our annual report. It should be, uh, it should be well uh, documented, need to be uh, well proved. Then we have balance. The, any organization who is publishing these material topics in their sustainability report should, uh, should be balanced means unbiased reporting should be there, should have a fair representation of organizations, negative and positive impact. It should be very clear to the stakeholders. For example, I'm a layman. I do not really understand the technical terms. So it should be in a very accessible and understandable manner that should be communicated in the reports. It should be comparable. Comparability should be there, which means in 2021, I published my annual report, uh, I published my sustainability report, and again in the year of uh, 2022, when I'm publishing my report, the parameters or the metric we have used should be comparable. Because why this comparability is so important that 
with the help of this uh, data, we can actually analyze or assess how we have improved or degraded in terms of a specific parameter so that accordingly we can strategize and push forward our actions for minimizing the impact of a particular uh, material topic. It should be uh, another one is the completeness. The organization should provide a sufficient information to enable an assessment of the organization's impact during the reporting period. Context, sustainability context, that report the information about its parameter in a wider context of sustainable development. It should not be only related to the environmental perspective. It should include the human rights. It should include the social perspective, etc. Then we have a timeliness. It is not like even if you go to the GRI website, you'll find out there are some organizations they have uploaded their report uh, in 2016-17. And after 17, you may, if you search out, you do not find any of the reports. So it should not be there. For example, in terms of annual reports, we regularly publish our annual report because we are compelled by the compliance, by the SEBI or uh, the companies or act or some of the regulators are here. But because this reporting is voluntary, so we are not very time bound and we are not very, uh, we do not follow the timeliness. But it is necessary for us as an organization that we need to report the information in a very regular interval so that it will be available to our stakeholders. And apart from the stakeholders, I would say it is it will be much more beneficial for the organization itself because with the help of these reports, they can actually strategize. Then we have verifiability. Now, when we are uh, conceptualizing or forming our report, it is necessary that we should have, uh, we, it should be verified. Likewise, the internal audit and external audit we do in our uh, annual reports, that should be done by some third party. But it is a challenge. Uh, it is a challenge in the sense that uh, very few experts are available. Uh, usually, uh, the accountants and the chartered, uh, these chartered accountants and uh, the accounting people used to verify these reports. But they are not available, especially when we are talking about the sustainability context. Thus, uh, we need to have uh, uh, sustainability experts in this area and they need to verify that. And verifiability is very much important primarily because tomorrow, any of the investors, be it as a uh, fund manager in mutual fund is investing in this area. And uh, maybe there is a discrepancy. For example, if I tell you the Volkswagen case, uh, they came up with a car and claimed that this car is very much uh, uh, helpful for the environment, have a very low emission comparatively, 40 times lesser than the emissions we were having passed in the past. But when the research has been conducted, it has been found out that the parameters on which they have claimed that it is 40% lesser than the 40 times lesser, it is comparatively more than that. So now the concept of the this trust has been breached. That, that's why it is important to understand that verifiability or talk about the reporting principles we need to abide by. And if you look into this, uh, uh, GRI topic specific standards. We have somewhere around 33 specific standards are available, and they are in all specific domains. If we talk about when uh, we did our research, by that point of time, we were having uh, uh, a different picture of these specific standards because we had to work on these specific standards only. So, at that point of time, we were having uh, somewhere around uh, 91 specific standard disclosures were there. And uh, under the GRI G4. But here in this uh, new uh, development, they have categorized in a different manner. And uh, especially in a universal standard disposal, they make it very mandatory that you need to report all the possible standards uh, at every point of time. Then, along with that, they have told that uh, uh, they have introduced this human right uh, part into the uh, in universal disclosures. And uh, apart from that, if we talk about uh, the most important perspective which, we, which they have included into that is that at any point of time, if you feel that you are having a problem, for example, when you are choosing a material topic, you may say that maybe the emissions uh, are not into that area. I'm an IT industry, I'm not into that area, so I'm not reporting the emission part, I'm excluding it. There at that point of time, 
you need to specify that why you are not reporting. So that is there in uh, uh, GRI 103, where they have told that materiality, when you are talking about this, you need to discuss about the materiality topic. And if you are not reporting any of these specific standards, for example, then you need to justify that uh, we are into the specific industry, we do not use it, or we do not have that kind of uh, uh, issues. So that's why we are not reporting. And if you are reporting, you need to elaborate on that. As uh, Banerjee was talking about, that in, in uh, these reporting standards, especially the universal standards, if I don't know, related to the GRI, they are more focusing on the governance perspective, human rights perspective, because today at this point of time, every organization, if those who are the investors, they might be understanding that when usually we do the fundamental analysis for our stocks, and we always check who is the, like, what is the structure of board of uh, uh, members, who are the uh, directors, independent, independent directors, what is their qualifications, etc. that need to be assessed by individual as a, as a normal investor I'm talking about. So you can imagine when a mutual fund manager is actually investing a very huge amount of corpus in these uh, companies, they have to look into all these perspectives uh, and dimensions. So for that, GRI has increased a uh, strong focus on universal standards and you need to mention all these standards at any point of time. So that if uh, uh, any individual, any investor or any uh, stakeholder can actually assess that and look into the perspective that what actually the company is doing. Now, if you talk about the GRI, why it is so important at this point of time and most of the organizations are actually uh, using the GRI standard, uh, the important thing is that it abides by all the regulators who are there and work in very close with the uh, sustainable development goals if you talk about. It is working very close with the uh, task force on the climate change and financial disclosures. It work on uh, very closely with the CDP. Then integrated reporting framework, or SASB industry standard, if we talk about, though they are two different uh, frameworks, but they are in consultation with each other uh, in terms of any of the frameworks which are coming up or any of the disclosures they are publishing. They are in continuous consultation. Then we have this VLAM impact assessment. It is a very interesting tool. It is a, if you can uh, check out on the website of this particular uh, uh, standard, you may find out that this standard primarily focuses on the social dimension, how your, your organization is working in terms of social aspect. So there you need to fill up the data and uh, with the help of this particular uh, agency, it will help you to compare yourself with a different set of uh, companies who, are, who have already listed into this uh, 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 website. So this GRI is actually working very closely with these uh, organizations and other regulators, likewise ILO convention, uh, conventions, OECD, United Nations. That's why this GRI is, is a uh, most sought framework in, uh, in, uh, across the industry. Now, as we have been discussing about, there are numerous uh, frameworks, ESG framework, reporting frameworks are available. So I just try to compare the available frameworks. Now, if you look into the GRI, which is the most short one, so this have a set of standards which comprise of the two, like the universal and the uh, specific standards. Audience is all stakeholders focus on the business impact of society in a broader sense. GRI actually, uh, covers very broader perspective. It focuses on ESG, that is environment, social and governance. It does not have a scoring and does not cost or charge you. Similarly, if you talk about the SASB, it is more industry specific standard. They have, as I told that they have around 77 specific, uh, sector specific standards are there uh, with seven uh, six uh, uh, guiding principles. And they primarily focus on investors. Because this uh, SASB concept has been from the US, so they are more focused on the business perspective, investors and creditors. So they look into that if any of the organization is reporting according to the SASB, there they have the matrices available. You need to put that data and it will be more, uh, it will be more visible in a quantified manner. 
And honestly speaking, uh, being a researchers and uh, uh, scholars in the academic area, we believe that if we are publishing our papers in a quantified form, uh, we are getting more easier responses. At the same time, if I am publishing my paper in a qualitative format, maybe the result might be lesser. But GRI is a comprehensive framework which gives you a very detailed information in a very global perspective, in a very vast perspective. Then we have a CDP, which is very close to the climate disclosures and specific to the uh, specific area. Then we have SDGs. Uh, it, in SDGs, we have a lot many indicators are available under the 17 uh, uh, different set of SDGs which are there. Then we have uh, this task force on the climate-related financial disclosures. It is focusing on the climate change issues. So it is a specific one. Then we have a United, United Nations Global Compact, again focusing on the climate change issues. It is having the 10 principles, and accordingly, uh, the companies need to publish. But if, if you talk about in a broader sense that uh, sustainable GRI or SASB even follows this UN uh, Global Compact, then we have a CDSB. So we have a, a CDSB. So if we look into the comparison of these uh, different frameworks, they are almost addressing the same kind of phenomena and they are working on the same horizon. They are targeting all the possible stakeholders. Some are very specific, some are very broader in their nature, and they address the uh, ESG reporting different set of the frameworks. Now, if you if you plot all these uh, frameworks, uh, if uh, we'll answer it in the end, uh, just be bear with us. So, if you uh, put all these uh, frameworks and the principles under the one graph, you'll find out that broader and focused scope, ESE scope, it is broad and focused. So, here if you see the CDP, it is very specific, talking about the uh, uh, disclosures very specific into that area. Then, if you talk about the ECMB, it is again talking to the uh, related to the climate change specific in that area. Similarly, integrated reporting, as I as we have discussed, it is more focused on the investor and creditor. So, it is primarily focusing on the, the very focus into that area. Then, if you look into the GRI, if you look into the SDG or ISO, ISO is a very broad framework have been introduced in 1947. Uh, so it is covering all the possible aspects. Even ISO also have uh, some of the certifications in the climate change also. Uh, two specific, uh, uh, what you can say, uh, uh, standards are there, uh, certifications are there in that area. So they are also working very closely. But here the most important part is if you look into the GRI. GRI is primarily more focused in that area, it is talking about all possible stakeholders and encompassing every possible thing. That's why GRI is being used by majority of the organizations across the world. Now, if you look into, if you, if you try to put this into the amalgamation of the financial and non-financial papers, like in European Union, this non-financial sustainability disclosures are in uh, very uh, pace. So, are in a pace. So, if you look into that, integrated reporting is very close to the financial perspective, where they are primarily focusing on the financial uh, aspects and uh, focusing on the financial aspect. Then, if you talk about SASB, because it is under integrated reporting, we have SASB. Uh, uh, CDSB, etc. So they are very close to the financial uh, perspective. At the same time, if you talk about the GRI, it is global. It is it is talking about all possible uh, uh, set of horizons. Be it is the financial perspective, be it is the social indicators or environmental perspective. It is talk targeting all possible stakeholders across the board. It is not only for the investors or creditors. It uh, inculcate every possible stakeholder whose service available. It can be easily read by any individual if you talk about. Uh, if you see the, any of the sustainability reports, you'll find out that usually the sustainability reports are full of the pictures because and a lot many explanations have been mentioned. 
because these sustainability report at this point of time give us a picture that how any organization, for example, GSW or other organizations that might not know, how these organizations are actually working in that area related to the environment or social or human rights, how these organizations are actually addressing these sustainability issues and aspects in the, their reports. So GRI is one, I would say, at this point of time, would be more preferable compared to the SASB. But SASB is good for investors, those who are uh, working in the finance area. Uh, if you are, uh, if you can collect the information on the SASB uh, website, you will find out. Because they are more inclined toward the investors and related to part, or maybe the financial perspective, then for finance guys, it is comparatively easier. But GRI gives us a holistic view of uh, the sustainability practices have been made by the organizations. So uh, in this, we have, that's it for uh, the basics and the sustainability reporting practices. Now, some of the questions have been raised, like somebody has asked like, is GRI followed in India? Yes. Uh, if you look into the SEBI's uh, uh, website, you'll find out that SEBI is working very closely or Ministry of uh, corporate affairs is working very closely with the GRI and uh, the principles which have been mentioned under the PRR, Business Responsibility Report, which has been changed as Business Responsibility and Sustainability Report la uh, last year, they include uh, GRI perspective only and they are in very close consultation with the GRI. Then we have like, how would you de differentiate the basics of shareholders and stakeholders in, in regards to the reporting mechanism? Uh, shareholder, uh, when I'm talking about the stakeholders, it includes the shareholders, investors, everybody, but shareholder is a very broad perspective where a consumer, uh, a supply chain partner, or uh, somebody who is not directly related with the value chain of an organization will also come into the stakeholder uh, domain. But shareholders are those people who have some uh, who are directly financially related with that organization. If you have like bought some of the shares for the company, then you will be a part of our organization. But a stakeholder may not be the part of that organization, but have getting affected because of uh, the organization's action. What information should reach each of the players who are very important in coordinating in the corporate forum? Exactly. This is for, the, uh, uh, for that particular reason. Sustainability reports are published so that any individual, any stakeholder who serves there can actually go through these things and understand that uh, how companies are actually working. If you look into the sustainability reporting framework, it simply says that for your business and what you are doing for the environment or uh, social perspective that need to be addressed in your sustainability uh, reports. So with the help of these sustainability reports, uh, any of the stakeholder can check and understand that what is going on in the business particularly. So, do it. is there any other questions? Is there any other question? Okay, guys, so this is it for the present session. Thank you, uh, sir, for yes, providing us valuable insight. Uh, everything with the participants in the drive, which we, uh, the link which we have shared with you guys. So uh, hopefully by end of the day, you process everything, and by end of the day, we'll try to share the beginnings with the, each, of, each one of you. And uh, you can go through that. If any other question is there, you may, because I'm not able to hear the voices, so if you guys can uh, post your question in the chat box, it will be easy to address. Okay. So we are winding up the session for the day uh, for uh, okay.
you may ask like in a WhatsApp group also because I'm uh, somehow seeing that they are not able to uh, do ask the question. So you may ask the question in a WhatsApp also. Okay, uh, so thank you guys. We may wind up the session. Top areas of the research in this. Top areas in the research is like uh, here. If I tell you, uh, the sustainability reporting is is a wide spectrum where anybody from any area. For example, if I tell you in management, uh, if you are from the uh, if you are uh, working in a corporate governance, this is one of the area where you can work on. Then, if you are working in the area of finance. It is very much well accepted uh, area of the research. Even if you are working for the marketing uh, in social sustainability dimension, uh, uh, GRI 3, uh, 400, there are three to four indicators, disclosures are there, which are primarily focusing on uh, uh, the marketing part, where they are focusing on the consumer perspective, how consumers are actually responding, how you are handling the complaints. Then, even the advertising perspective have been had addressed in that particular area. So, uh, if you talk about uh, uh, the specializations, every specialization can come and come and participate in the uh, research domain of uh, sustainability, or specifically, if I talk about the sustainability report. Uh, Nidhi, we will be uh, you will be having a session uh, probably tomorrow evening on finance. Uh, as much I can tell you, uh, like the concept of the sustainable finance, green finance, green bonds, sustainable bonds, and this one of them, the concept of sustainable bonds are increasing. And a lot many uh, uh, companies are coming up with the bond specific sustainable bonds. So, what is the future of uh, the concept of sustainable bond is there in the in the present uh, stock market? Uh, that is one of the area which is very promising, and people are working in this area. So, uh, in sustainability, then we have like. When we are talking about ESG reporting, does it really have helping us or improving the performance, financial performance or not? Uh, that is one of the area. Or uh, like how when we are talking about the corporate governance, does the corporate governance is having an impact on the financial performance or just like that we are reporting? So there are a lot many perspectives are there. Maybe this is the second session. Uh, in various sessions, uh, you'll find out yes, 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 yes. from the experts yes, yes, yes. in the area, uh, uh, maybe informant. Uh, and I would say that you must ask questions so that it will be really helpful for you guys to uh, develop interest in this area. And this is the most promising area at this point of time. And maybe in another uh, for the next 10 years, this will be the area of research. Thank you, guys. We'll wind up the session here itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I can't hear you. I don't know. From my side, there is a problem. So, if you have any uh, question, you may write in the chat box. That will be comparatively easier. There is some problem in my computer. So anyways, uh, Alka, you may take over. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for providing us valuable insight. Your thought-provoking session set a perfect platform for all of us to learn. Now, as the question is around over and we are exceeding our time limit, uh, we will meet again at 3 o'clock in MS team only. Thank you all. Uh, regarding the attendance, uh, it is a kind request to all of you that you please raise your hand so that uh, we can mark your attendance. Uh, 
Alka and uh, Rajat will take care of that. So all of you, those who are available here, please mark your attendance because it may happen that you have logged in and uh, move away from the desk. So if you are raising your hand, with the help of that, we can understand that how many of you are present here. Alka, please may, uh, take note of that in the Excel form which we have, the list of uh, attendees. Yes, sir. I'm unable to raise my hand. Excuse me, I've been present. Okay, please, I have a look into that and I accordingly mark that I'm leaving the meeting. Thank you, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Alka, I've, I've been, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, able to raise my hand, but I've been present all through, okay? Okay, ma'am, I've noted that. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Can we leave the session now? Alka, can we proceed for lunch, please, if you could respond? Yeah, you guys can leave. I have take the attendance. Thank, Thank you, Alka. Thank you. Uh, how do we know whether our attendance is recorded or not? I have noted all the names and in the last you can see in other portal. All the attendance will be there. Okay, okay. So we can leave now. I can also leave you. Yes. Okay. Was this was this also done for the same? There, there will be another link for next session. Sorry. There will be separate link for next session or we leave here logged in only? No, there is separate link. Uh, you can access the link. It's day one, uh, session three. It start with it start from three o'clock. Okay. Alka, for the previous session also, did you have this raising of hands? And I'm unaware why I'm not able to raise hands. The three buttons is not coming on my screen. Actually, in previous session, we had technical problem. That's why we shifted to Zoom. Uh, but we took the attendance by seeing the list of the participants. So okay. don't worry about that. But from now on, in MS team, we can see the raising of hands. Okay, but then why is that three uh, dots not coming and I'm not able to raise my hand? I think there's some technical glitch because it's uh, the dot is present. Maybe no, you uh, log in from different email ID uh, means you logged in in Atal from different ID. Now you are uh, joining this meeting from different ID. Yeah, but that's because I spoke to sir and he told me that I can log in from my official email ID. My institutional ID. Okay. Is that uh, fine? Try yeah, it's fine. Just I'm saying, try once with your original email ID. 
maybe that's the same key that is registered okay yeah i'll try that yeah yeah thank you thank you